You are listening to the Gritty Podcast, where we talk about all things gritty. Welcome to the Gritty Podcast. I am your host, Brian Call. I've got my co-host here beside me, Brad Hunt. And today's podcast is with Nathan Endicott. I've been following Nathan for years now. He has a great YouTube channel pr- producing some really great hunt content, period. Yeah. But archery, blacktail content specifically, archery content that I think is, wow, it's it's not easy to do what he's done. And he's produced some great films. Mm-hmm. And I just don't think enough people know about his his content. Yeah. And uh, his his show, his <clears throat> YouTube channel ought to be elevated so people know about it. Uh, much like Josh Car- uh, Kirchner, um, Nathan has a great show. He put out a couple of hunts recently that are mountain blacktail hunts that you might, they might as well be more like mule deer hunts yeah, in the mountains exactly. in deep snow with a bow and arrow in his hand. He captures some really great uh, rutting uh, and uh, over the shoulder. Like I think he's self filming ninety percent of this thing. Mm-hmm. It's amazing. It's really amazing the content he captures, the way he's captured it, and he kills with a bow on these spot and stock mountain hunts. Yeah, it's pretty cool stuff. And I grew up doing a lot of these mountain hunts myself, mm-hmm. chasing blacktails in the mountains of Oregon. And it's really cool to see someone that lives in that area uh, showcase it. Um, blacktails go, they lose their minds. Like, like just about mule deer and, and white tails as well, but black tails, man, I've seen them just like brain dump and be like just a, so aggressive. And uh, so, and, and when you hit that magic moment, which he captures in some film, he's able to stalk in on some of these deer. They, they're the type of deer that run away and come right back five minutes later. They're just so rutted mm-hmm. and, and uh, it's a, it's an intense experience. So very cool. He, his dad, uh, Wayne, Wayne Endicott yep. runs the bow rack and bow hunting has been, you know, since birth, his yeah. thing. So lots of bow hunting type uh, experience that comes with the show. So check it out. <clears throat> Hope you enjoy this show with Nathan. Like I said, go follow his, his uh, channel, check out his films, binge watch them all. They're good stuff. And we'd love to see his channel grow. Subscribe over there and uh, leave him a comment and yeah excited to see uh see what you guys think leave us a comment below let us know what you think of nathan's films if you go and watch them we try to respond to all the comments in our youtube and rumble channels in the description fields in the comment sections below uh we really appreciate your support use the code gritty over at stealthy hunter if you need a glassing pad rifle cover uh if you need some supplements for your health they've got vitamin k and d and they've got CBD gummies, sleep gummies. Mm-hmm. They've immune got support. Uh, immune support. Yeah. So they've digestive health. Gut everything. health products, all that kind of stuff. And then if you use the code gritty for a little uh, mountain ops ignite, if you need a little pick me up caffeine, the Yeti mode yeah. pre-workout, that might break you. But if you like really need some pick me up, that's, that's a, that's a shot. That's a jolt of lightning. Yes. You can check out some of those products. Use the code Gritty over at Mountain Ops, and that helps us keep doing our show. We appreciate you. Thank you for tuning in, and uh, stay gritty. All right, folks. Welcome to the Gritty Podcast. I am your host, Brian Call, and today my guest is Nathan Endicott. And Nathan, ha- you're, you're born and raised in, where is it, Oregon, Eugene? Kind of area? Uh, Springfield, Oregon. Springfield? Yeah, Springfield. Yep. Springfield, Oregon, and um, we, I, I sort of, I mean, I know s- some of your background, but why don't you real quick introduce the audience to you, give us a little high level Nathan Endicott uh, explanation background, um, and just to, just to let people know, like, Nathan has been hunting blacktails for quite a while, I watched a film a number of your films, but this last one was so cool. I really felt like my audience would love to see your content and I wanted to get to know you myself. So I, uh, I asked if you could join me on the podcast and you generous, generous, generously said yes. So here we are. So give us a little background on, on yourself. Yeah. Well, thanks too, for having me on. And, 
It's a pleasure to meet you. I feel honored that I get to talk to you. Um, I mean, too, like part of it is I would have hoped to, you know, meet you in person for for this type of first talk here, but um, I'll do my best. And a little bit about myself. So I'm from Springfield, Oregon, born and raised here. Uh, that's, you know, um, ground zero for the Borac. And you're pretty aware of the Borac and Cam Haynes and all of that. So that was my childhood, right? I grew up in the Borac, literally in the clothing rack at times or on the range. Um, <laughs> How old are and, you, Nathan? Uh, I am 20 at uh, 35. <laughs> My <laughs> phone just dinged, so I'm going to turn it off. No worries. Um, so you're 35. Right. You're 35. And the bow rack, for people who don't know, I'm very aware of it. It was in my backyard uh, when I lived in Oregon. Uh, yeah. t- tell people real quick, what what is the bow rack? Yeah, it's a pro archery shop uh, on the West Coast, right? Uh, bow rack's been around for 35 years that my dad's owned it. Even before that, 1973, I believe, is when the first shop opened. It was on Main Street in Springfield, Oregon. And since uh, a few years later, I think it was around when I was born, I want to say around 88, is when my dad purchased uh, the bow rack. And then from there, he's just been running it. There's a few times where he took a break from the shop, but for the most part, he's run it his whole life. So they sell bows and arrows and merchandise, right? Uh, I was a part of it. I would be down there selling stabilizers, doing the whole trick on, look at this absorption it has when it hits the ground. Like I was selling people bows as like an eight-year-old. Um, and it just brings up so many fun memories about the shop and growing up there, uh, learning archery equipment. Cam Haynes coming in was a kid. And the first thing I would do to anybody I thought was cool, I'd be like, hey, you want to shoot for a pop? So that's a soda pop. And I would challenge anybody that came in. And of course, Cam, he's so competitive and he would always challenge me and win. But I was good, like surprisingly good for my equipment. People would look at me, like size me up like this eight-year-old kid. He's got this green little PSC bow and and these wire sights. Sights were wires, yeah, right? Yeah. And they would just, no way could this, I shot 20 yards like all day. So I would challenge people and say, hey, whoever gets close to the spot gets a soda. And so that would be the challenge. And um, I never could pay up, but if I won, <laughs> is it was all in my favor. All right. So that's a little bit about the Borac, but uh, born and raised here, I was very involved in athletics and that through high school um, set me up to go on to college to compete as a distance runner. So I completed at a D1 level for five years and went to school for civil engineering. Uh, I was fortunate to graduate during that time and get a job right out of college, more or less, had a couple internships and currently work at a water utility in Eugene, Oregon. So that's what I do. I'm a civil engineer there. Um, I am 35, married, have three kids. So when you're talking about Brad and him and I talked a little bit, it's like, dude, I feel you. I'm right there in the trenches with you. Um, And when my wife steps away, it's like 24 hours and I'm like doing everything I can to hold off on calling her just like, do this. (laughs) Yeah. I kill blacktail. I could watch my kids. Um, so, uh, yeah. And then recently two and a half years ago, moved, um, up a little bit out of town and lived kind of in the country, get to work from home these days. So it's really nice. And, um, just fortunate really to, to be wow. here and doing what I love to do hunting in <clears throat> Oregon. That's pretty cool. Um, so your dad, he loves, I mean, he's, I, I've shot uh, a couple times with your dad and, uh, I think maybe it was at a mountain challenge or something like that, but uh, he's quite the archer. So how do you stack up against your dad? Can you take him? <laughs> uh, to be honest, no, I can't. Um, it seems like my dad always has the newest everything, right? <laughs> like the best arrows, the best yeah. bow. He's bragging about it. And I'm looking at my like axis 300s <laughs> and uh, I, I mean, I shoot it through paper. It, it flies straight. And, um, and I put in a lot, I put in a lot of time and I feel like where I have an advantage over maybe some that are really good shots is that it's like the, in the moment in like in a heated situation, when you're in the red zone, animals coming in, Mm -hmm. it's like, I can hold my composure and, and everything is just muscle memory. And the way I set up my bow is that it's bomb proof. If I hit the ground, which I have dozens of time on that high country hunt that I do in blacktail. And I'll talk about that. I'm sure. But I want to make sure when I pick up my bow, it's still going to shoot right. And so a lot of my equipment is built to be tough. 
And when I practice, I'm, I'm going for grouping, right? And I want to group as close as I can to the middle, but I'm not necessarily that precision shooter that's going to outshoot my dad. And my dad, again, I mean, he owns the bow rack. He's done this, you know, a lot longer than I have. Um, and I mean, if we shot head to head on something random, um, maybe I would be able to get him on a couple of shots, but I th- I'd say overall, like we do a 3d shoot, he's a great shot. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Not going to top that guy. <laughs> that's cool though. So, uh, Fast forward to modern day. Okay. I've been watching your Instagram channel for quite a long time. Some of the YouTube content that you've created and you're out there pursuing blacktail in some mountain country. And I've hunted blacktail in out of, you know, the foothills of Mount hood, Estacada, uh, in Oregon city in the Willamette Valley. And I grew up right over there in my early twenties. I was out there trying to to get permission when I could draw the Willamette Valley tag and I'd have two buck tags in one season, you know, or I'd just, just hammer the, the late season. Something I never really did was <clears throat> head South. I, I always planned on it, but I never went further South and the season opened back then a little earlier than it does up North where, where I was at out of Oregon city. But one thing I loved about the, the Willamette Valley tag that I would grab every now and then, or six fifteen, or I don't know what they is. It still the same, same, same. Yeah. So I get that tag, and it was a lot of private property type uh, um, opportunities. Although there was some public land you could could jump out on, but man, blacktail are so tough. They're so tough. Um, you know, even where I grew up. And I was fortunate enough to be able to hunt on some pretty nice areas. And my buddy, Anthony Spencer, who, who really started archery hunting and uh, muzzle loader hunting, whatever he, whatever was legal at the time, he was just hunting blacktails. Like as soon as he was old enough to do it right there out of their backyard on neighbor's properties with permission. And, you know, kind of reminds me of your Eastern whitetail type guys who grow up in, in, uh, you know, areas like Ohio or, or, or Iowa and they get permission or Kansas and they get permission to hunt some spot, you know, but it's, it's not far from your house and, and you're putting up some cameras and you're scouting the place. And, but with blacktail, what I noticed was the rut was the equalizer outside of the rut. They moved so much at night. It seemed if they moved at all. Um, I had a hard time even finding a blacktail. Um, I'd have cameras up like, like 50 cameras in certain areas. I mean, insane. Right when they first started coming out and I just started buying cameras and I'm like, if there's a deer here, I want to find it. And it was like, I'd seen almost just little bucks throughout the year, spring, summer, but then right around that first week of October right after Halloween and into mid October, sometimes up through Thanksgiving or first week in November, first week in November. Uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. November. That's what I meant. Yeah. Yeah. November, just after Halloween, first week in November, all of a sudden I'd see in daylight five, six, seven bucks that I'd never seen the other 300 and uh, what 58 days of the year, 55 days of the year. It's just like, and then in that 10 day window, there's some magic that happens and then it's over again. <sighs> and, and it was right. like, wow. It was like this, this epiphany for me. There's deer here. I don't know where they are the rest of the time, but they're here then. Right. Then I started to expand and go and hunt some of the migration routes in some of those areas in Estacada where, where the deer are moving around. And uh, they're coming off the mountain due to the snow and the weather would play an impact. And then I started getting into a lot, a little better season, I would say, a little more action, a little more animals, which is, I think, more akin to what your, what your hunt is probably like. Um, But I wanted to, I wanted to hear your thoughts on, on blacktail. What makes them, first of all, describe blacktail to me and, and what makes them a little different than other deer in your opinion? Yeah, no, that's great. And you, you just covered a lot, right? So, um, you kind of started in the North and worked your way South and some of your experience, the Southern units open up a week or early. And so that is a good opportunity to get out and get your feet wet more or less in the, um, 
you know, in the fall and try your luck down South. There's really good bucks down South and right along the border of California. And a lot of that is a migration type hunt in the units that we do have open. Not every unit on the West side is open for the late hunt. The most are, but not all of them. And some of the coastal units are shut for the late hunt. They're er open in the early season, which is back in uh, September, but for the late hunt, there's just a select few. So in the South, those deer, the rut hunt is most likely around like November 10th. And then as you move North, it usually happens, um, a little earlier, like we're talking days within the week. And so starting from the coast going East to the cascade crest, that's our boundary. And then North South, generally speaking, most of the West side, again, some of the units are closed. So that's kind of covering the, uh, geography of our, uh, black tail. And we do get a little bit of crossover from mule deer and every once in a while, there'll be a mule deer doe on the West side. Uh, but for the most part, we call it a black tail deer, um, or just a Western deer tag. Right. Um, you know, you talked about the Valley, uh, hunting the Valley and so there's a lot of private land and that Willamette unit tag, that Willamette unit stretches nearly the whole Valley from, uh, the Southern end, where it's about the Eugene Springfield area, all the way up to the Columbia river gorge. And there's a lot of private timber that you can get permit access to hunt. There's landowners. And that's kind of what it's intended for because these deer, they get overpopulated and they're eating, you know, whatever is being grown on the ag fields. And so that's why they give out those tags in the 600 series. It's an extra deer tag, as you mentioned. So I've only ever drawn it once, mostly because I'm not a private land guy. I just don't have the property access. One of those things where growing up, there's so much public land. My dad always took me out on public land and and that's where I established. That's where I cut my teeth. That's where I want to go. I don't want to worry about where my feet are. And that was the hardest thing about leaving the state is I worried so much about, I didn't want to mess up. I didn't want to cross some boundary. And then Onyx comes out and then my GPS now has property bound, um, boundaries and landowner names. It's the resources are there now. Now there's really no excuse why you can't, you know, go closer to private lands and, and know where you stand at all times. But that was my big hesitation about getting out uh, or really hunting in the valley. So I've always hunted high higher elevations, national forest, wilderness areas. Um, those, we have a ton in Oregon. It is, as you know, it is the, I don't know the percentage, but I would gander to say like 70%. Like, I mean, it seems like public land is just super abundant and, um, for black tail deer, the rut, if I want to cover this topic right now, I'll just go ahead and say it is that generally too on the coast, the rut starts a little bit earlier around that first week in November, you were talking about that. And then as you go into the higher elevations, it's a little later around Thanksgiving timeframe is maybe peak rut middle of November. And I think a lot of that depended on, uh, over time mule deer had to migrate or black tail had to migrate down into more of the breeding areas. And so it pushed the rut back because the weather didn't hit until a little bit later in the winter. So maybe the ruts later because these deer had to be consolidated to smaller areas before they'd really breed. Now, local deer is what I call more or less the valley and the coast. These deer live in their best habitat year round. You pretty much can catch them at night all times of the year. Like you said, when you're running 500 cameras and, uh, or 50, whatever it was, yeah. um, 500 is like kind of expensive on the wallet, but <laughs> I only ever run one or two cameras, to be honest. I don't even like running cameras. I don't want people to know that there's even the inclination that deer could be around or somebody might hunt mm -hmm. or the chance that they could steal it or take the card or see me. Like, sure. I don't want to have any clues. You know, I leave no trace basically in that respect. But uh, that's why I pretty much focus on the higher elevations because it times better too with the rut and when our late hunt opens. So down South, it opens up that week early. So then it's an extra opportunity, yep. but the rut's already going by the time archery comes around, around November 21st. Yeah. So when the rut opens, deer maybe even peak, right? So I'm catching up to whatever has been going mm -hmm. on. Mm -hmm. And so I always say that every day past Thanksgiving, the hunt gets exponentially harder. So if that's your peak, yeah. it's like one, it's one times harder, two times harder, right? It just keeps getting harder and harder all the way through until the end of the season. Sometimes we have a second rut, maybe the younger does or the like, the yearling does, they're coming to heat later. Maybe a buck will get fired up again around. We've seen it all the way into January, honestly, um, where a buck's pushing a doe around. So it can happen, but we're talking one in a hundred. So that's not very high odds. So describe the blacktail. 
the Valley deer, in my opinion, kind of look a little bit more mangy or scruffy or like the backyard deer. And then as you go up, you get this pristine, beautiful high country deer, double white throat patch, unique colors, kind of a sandy coat, sometimes red, sometimes more of a gray color. They're blockier heads, bigger, you know, chested, like big shoulders on them. It's just, I don't know. It's the difference for me is why would I want to go hunt this smaller deer that doesn't look as pretty when I can go hunt and kill myself in the high country (laughs) to find this beautiful, you know, deer that I I really care a lot about. And the Mm -hmm. genetics are so diverse. I think the genetics are so diverse because of the migration, because of maybe yeah, uh, historic influence from mule deer. Yeah. I'll say this, like one of the reasons, so with the general deer tag that kicks in around, you know, years ago, around November 17th is when, when the second season would open up for, for, for deer up North near Mount Hood, Escada area and so forth. So, uh, I would already have my general deer tag, but if I drew the 615, then I'd have another deer tag. So for me, it was like, why not hunt two bucks in the same year rather than one? Also, with the 615 tag in the valley, and I can I can shoot that season is months long, not just a few weeks. So and it's any weapon. Uh, so you can use a shotgun, you can use a bow, you can use a different weapon during um, during the season. So if you're if you if if you want to really maximize some odds, you can get that extra tag. So for me, the Willamette Valley was simply more hunting opportunity. It didn't it didn't right. discount my other tag. I could still do the other high mountain stuff, which is what we did. So I would hit the valley for right around Halloween in the days following for for seven to ten days, and then usually it would get exponentially harder to kill the buck in the valley after after the after the 17th 18th 20th it was tough at least where i was at so then i would then move north once my my general tag kicked in and then i would go hunt the mountain migratory areas like you're talking about the thing that i discovered yeah. with the the valley bucks is there are some giants. I've seen some giants taken. Some, some, some. Yes. But in general, I would say, yeah, they're not like the mountain bucks. In fact, we call them bench bucks. Uh, a lot of these, uh, there was a different number of different names that we, because for us, they were kind of like a mule deer blacktail cross almost. Because when we get up into these, where it's more genetically diverse, I think. You're getting a little bit of a mule deer slash blacktail blend sometimes, and so even though there's a line on the map where it's it's supposed to be blacktail over here and mule deer over here, that's not really how nature works. And so, no, they don't respect boundary. <laughs> no, and so uh, there were some massive, but you know, mule deer or bl- blacktails that were taken that obviously had some. You could tell they were kind of a blend of of mule deer blacktail in their genetics there as they kind of intermix a little bit but that's what made those mountain hunts to me really exciting was there were just you never knew what you were going to get but there were just some giant deer just big racked bucks that aren't traditionally thought of as as so we would sometimes in the valley we would make fun of we we would kind of say like any buck taken there isn't a real black tail the real black tails sure. are down by the coast you know the mountain we, we like ones. to pat our backs you know <laughs> yeah, you shoot the, this small little dink for he it's like <laughs> but that's a bench leg <laughs> heck right. with that so uh but i would say that um the most exciting by far was not the valley the exciting part the valley was convenient You'd come home after work or before work, you could hit it for two or three hours and then get to hit the office and come back and you could go every day of the week in the evening, um, cut out early. There was just options there and it was so convenient. And then you could sort of check cameras all year, see what's going on right in your backyard, your neighbor's property down the road and all these different spots you've got. Then when I wanted to really take three or four days off over a long weekend, that's where I would hit the mountain units and hike in in the snow a good mile mile and a half and find some you know fresh fresh uh, reprod and and some 
logging road area and try to set up on the edge of two types of timber and tree stand or we'd rake or still hunt or whatever. So, I, but I would say that those were the hunts where the magic happened, where things went insane, where the grud, the, like with the stuff you captured on film, that's what I would see. We didn't run a camera back yeah. then, but that what you captured on that last film is exactly what I haven't seen hardly any of that sort of footage on many blacktail hunts. There's a few, there's been a few over the years, but nothing really consistent and nothing I think that I can recall anyway, that's at, yeah. at what, at the level that you captured. And, uh, so I got to hand it to you there. That was well done. And I, I recognize how hard it is to do. And there's something different about spot and stock and being on the ground for blacktail, like what you were doing versus the more typical route. Like I love cams stuff. I love cams book on hunting blacktails and I've seen a lot of cams films too. And he, you know, he, he'll be set up in a stand often. So will uh, Larry D Jones and others who have hunted some nice blacktails, but here you are doing yeah. kind of the, the spot and stock on the ground hunt, which, and to film it too, that's pretty impressive. So, um, anyway, let's talk about that a little bit as we're talking about these bucks, um, and how they're unique and different. Um, yeah, before we get into how you film it and stuff, tell me a little bit more about uh, the blacktail, uh, how you think it's a little bit different than other deer. Um, first, well, how it's a little bit different than other deer being a uh, whitetail mule deer blacktail. Yeah. Is that what you mean? Yeah. So, gosh, I've hunted whitetail before. And the reason why you would definitely take that strategy of sitting in a stand or a blind is because you don't want to push the deer off the property that you're hunting, right? Mm -hmm. Um, they're very territorial. They're going to have their same routes. You can pattern the deer, same with mule deer. You can pattern the deer so you can spot and stalk easier, watch them bed, get on them, shoot them. So it's like those strategies are pretty well prescribed. Why would you do it any other way? Blacktail. Why would you limit yourself to a tree? <laughs> I always, I name my film fate because I would rather put my fate in my own abilities, in my feet, in my senses, being able to hear, see, like smell sometimes these bucks, you know, pick them up before they see me. And when you pull it off, it's like the biggest rush of emotion. And it's like, it's not that it's not your reward necessarily that, oh, I did it this, this dip more difficult way, maybe on your feet, but it feels so right. It's almost like you're connecting to some, um, you know, deep rooted in your DNA sort of feeling that humans have done over all of time is that the depth, the odds were stacked against you. You had to be so in tune with your hunt to be able to kill an animal or to shoot it with a, you know, the old wood bows that they would construct and, and an arrow with, uh, with a broad, um, with just, uh, I'm blanking on the term arrowhead point, right? So to be able to pull that off, it probably felt incredible, such a rush of emotion. And then you're providing like, you didn't die. And so right. a lot of my hunt too, is that there's moments where I feel like I could just slip and fall off of a mountain or something. You talked about it recently in a podcast when you were, um, in New Zealand and just that feeling of like, gosh, this is life or death. And sometimes out on my hunt, I feel that. So when you're connecting with pure survival, using your senses, and then you're, you're outwitting these bucks on your feet, that feels very complete, feels whole. So I'd rather put my fate in myself, not a tree or a blind, you know, and, but it's very effective. Like if you're patterning a really big deer and you're like, I want this buck, none other then why wouldn't, yeah. I mean, to pattern him, do everything you can to kill that deer, sit in the tree. But for me, I don't feel attached necessarily to any one animal. Um, I see a lot of them yeah. and, and I just want a really mature buck. Right. And I want the best <clears throat> experience that I can, that I can live out everything that I do in all the different activities I do in life. I, I don't want any shortcuts. I want to earn it, right? Like mm -hmm. you're gritty. You want to earn it. You want to feel the work. You want to yeah. feel the dirt underneath your fingernails when you're working hard and, and, and you recover that animal. Like so much of who we are is built into the experience. So I want my experience to be through myself and I like my abilities. Yeah. So I want to depend on those. So that's talking about the different species and really kind of starting to touch on still hunting. 
one thing I, I did want to jump back on, and you talked about the strategy of down in the Willamette Valley, having that extra deer tag, it's harder to draw these days. It takes three points minimum to draw that tag. So it's a, yeah. So I there's mean, that. We used to get it every and, year. Uh, we yeah, used to get it every yeah, year. Yeah, exactly. And yeah. I think that that was probably true until, uh, you know, just got to be more popular. And so that's where I never really depended on having that tag and also not having the private uh, land to be able to hunt and then being able to target more the public land. And, uh, you talked a little bit too about, you know, the bench bucks and I just call them, um, a mix, you know, you, you can call them whatever you want, but I just call them a little bit of a mix. And I think it's true that black tail DNA stretches all the way over to the Ochicos, which I'm going to throw out like a number here. That's wrong. Like 50 miles, um, 60 miles, uh, east of the cascade. So black tail genetics span that far. And then going West, I believe it's the same, about the same number. So that's nearly all the way to the Valley that you can still have traces of mule deer DNA. And that's, that's a study that was published, um, several years ago now. And I was just Google searching, trying to research it myself, read through this study. I understood very little other than that. You can have this, this overlap of DNA. And it's just because it's, it was built into them for generations, like forever, all of time. There was Mm -hmm. since, uh, glaciers melted and, and animals could cross the cascades. That's how long they've been potentially mixing. So it's not like, oh, that one is a muley buck or 50% or bench buck. Like, you know, it's not that cut and dry. We're talking like that one might have 2% mule deer. That one might have eight. It's right, it's not right. yep, as yep. simple as saying they're all bench bucks. Cause right. I see genetics that are so diverse. Some of them are these little teeny basket bucks that are like, that's, that's just a hundred percent Valley buck. Like, you know, right. it's just. Or, you know, I don't know why he's up here. And every once in a while, you'll see things like that, where it just doesn't seem, it seems a little out of place. But for the most part, these deer are very big body deer. They have to survive a harsher winter. They're living in cliffy mountainous terrain. They're eating the lichen, the higher protein source that, you know, that falls out of the trees. So there's a different breed. Like yeah, it's like absolutely. a bodybuilder versus a distance runner. You know, I'm a distance runner. I don't look like a bodybuilder. <clears throat> Same concept. The same thing I've seen with the migration too. Like you'll hit it during a four or five day window where they're just, it just seems like you're on the the elevation that is magical. Like just deer are funneling in every day. Oh, sure. And big old bucks are coming in and chasing off other big bucks and they're all still rutting as they move down the mountain. And then it gets super deep and there's only a few bucks left at that elevation and we drop down to another bench and now we're kind of hunting at another elevation and we sort of follow this migration. Uh, that's been, that was incredible, but I also was shocked at how much snow they will st- t- still tolerate. Like uh, we've, yeah, we find them like waist deep and these deer are still, still rutting each other and hanging out up in those places, uh, which you'd think that's that right, snow would sure. push them out and they, and they stay. A lot of the more mature, older bucks I've noticed will stay as high as possible. And you definitely see this in Washington. I have a friend up in Washington that I've hunted blacktail with, and he runs his cameras and he'll see bucks that are chest deep. Uh, we see it every once in a while, but for the most part, our deer will stay, you know, at a manageable level in the snow, you know, that might be like up to their elbows or something like that. But yeah, they're tough animals. Uh, I, we have them in winter and a buck's going up higher elevations on camera and he's already pushing snow chest deep. And I think some of those really old bucks, they realize that they can survive that way. They find their spot and they're going to stay as high as possible. Eat the lichen that falls and stays on top of the snow. So they just pick, pick it off the top of the snow. They'll walk on top of the snow drifts, um, as, as if it can hard pack. So yeah, these deer are really tough. And you talked about migration. I haven't necessarily been out on a day where it's like a migration, like, you know, mule deer, when you think migration, you think mule deer and there's units and that have hunted out of state where you can sit on a hillside and there's trails just cut. Like yeah, you could yeah, see yeah. them from a mile and a half, two mm-hmm. miles, you know, you've been on those hunts yep. and you see these bucks coming out of the high country, you know, they just came over 20 yep. miles. Like yep. when I'm talking about migration, I mean, there's a they buck that hang six out miles. at an elevation, I think for a while. And then they sort of slowly push down. Sometimes yeah. they're tough. They stay as high as they can. Mm-hmm. Uh, I pick the sheds. My buddies and I pick sheds and they're as high as they could possibly survive. Really? They don't want to go. Yeah. They don't want to go any lower than they have to. These high country deer. It's, it has to do with this perfect combo of sunlight hitting massive old growth trees, heats up the tree, melts out the ground, and they can, they can have little habitat Pockets. zones. And so you, 
you learn this really well when you go to look for sheds and you're finding all these sheds lined up on the hillside in one unique little uh, draw or swale, things like that, where it was shaded more or less from wind maybe, but it just bakes from the sun. It's a south slope. Sun just bakes this little pocket and it melts out real good. Old trees are surviving there too, because it's kind of protected uh, from the wind. And that's, that's where you can kind of get into them. And the other thing, there is a correlation between where those bucks are dropping with sheds and where they like to live during the rut. So if you pick a bunch of sheds, you can have a pretty good idea that, Hey, I might want to come check this out during the, during the bow hunt. And that's just like a pro tip there. Nice. Okay. So tell me this, Nathan, uh, I've seen some blacktails just on those high mountain hunts. I've seen those blacktails just be stupid, uh, due to the black. Let's just, <laughs> yeah. I've seen some insane, uh, they're just out of their mind. Um, like they almost want to fight you. Like they see you <laughs> and it's like, I, I've, it's in, uh, tr- you know, I don't, I don't really run into that so much down in the Valley, but I'll run into that up, up on the mountains. Yeah. You seen that too? You brought up a great point. Yeah. It's like, while I want to talk up blacktail and a lot of guys will say, man, they're the gray ghost and they're so tough to kill. And I feel like there's this big caveat. It's like, well, yeah, until they're like rut dumb. And if they have either a too much exposure to humans, they get comfortable with humans or b no exposure to humans at all. They're super confused. I've, I've stood and very still without moving and had bucks like come by and be like, what's this stick thing (laughs) that I'm walking by. Right. And I just try to keep, so I've heard too, my dad always says it, but predators, you know, we have eyes on the front, not necessarily like the the sides of our head, um, like, uh, the prey would. And so if you kind of turn to the side, like cats, you don't stare at cats or cowardice and you know, you look at them and they duck. So it's like kind of turning your head. So anytime I get close to a buck and I realize he might see me, I always have to disguise eyes. So I turn my head and then I'm holding a camera as still as I can. And so I've had bucks walk up within feet. I almost touched a little spike, uh, two years ago on the hunt. Yeah. He just didn't know that I was standing there and literally walks up to me and I stick my hand out and then he's like, Whoa, something's yeah. standing there. And yeah, so there's that where there's just no exposure to people. And that's where I'm trying to find those bucks. Like, mm-hmm. I really like those bucks yeah, <laughs> because <too. laughs> you stand a chance of getting it with your bow. Right? right. Right. And then the other is when they're rut dumb, when they're rut dumb and they just, they got their nose in a doe. Um, and, and those situations I've had it a few times where, gosh, you could blow it, blow it, blow it, blow it. And you just don't quit. And eventually yeah. you're going to get a shot opportunity. And it's that's just- happened to me once, but it happens. And then yeah. I had a, I had a, um, a person with me one time. And they weren't able to shoot the buck, but we did that too. We just pursued, pursued, pursued. Eventually this buck walks by at 20 yards and, uh, and they weren't able to to get an arrow off. It was moving a little bit just right when they wanted to shoot, it moved. So yeah, it can, it can happen. So it's a cool experience. I I've been there where rattling also has worked really well with blacktails. Uh, they just, when they're in that aggressive mode, they're just, uh, I've seen a situation right around just before Thanksgiving where multiple times where a doe is in heat and she seems like the only doe in heat, I guess, because there's like five bucks <laughs> all trying to chase the same doe Yeah, and it's mad chaos. And if you just rattle your horns near the, near the, the frenzy, a couple will just run right over to you. And, uh, and then yeah. you shoot at them. And unfortunately I missed, and then they just ran off and <laughs> chased the dough some more. Yeah. And I did it again until then I, until I connected and, you know, a lot of other deer, <clears throat> especially like uh, generally whitetail in my experience, uh, they're, they have been more, uh, they've been, I'd say mule deer and uh, blacktail have been easier to call back in multiple times, almost like a, a, a rutting bull elk that's just lost its mind where with white tails. Um, and I have limited experience with white tails, but the ones that I have seen, they, they seem to, um, a lot more, um, what do you say? Like just neurotic. And so they're, they're like, as much as they're horny, they're also spook spook easy to spook you know where they they kind of are like i'm not even gonna investigate i'm out like their curiosity they're deer on crack to me they're so crazy skittish 
Yeah. And, and so it's like, yeah, I'm interested and I'm rut crazed, but at the same time I'm spooked. And, and there's this neurotic behavior that they display where um, mule deer and blacktail kind of like, like I said, a raging bull elk, I've seen them be able to be called in multiple times, or I've seen them get shot at and just be like, eh, whatever, <laughs> and not run away yeah. and still stay focused on the, on the dough. And you're like, yeah. you know, it just seems crazy. Now, not that it doesn't it's happen like, with whitetails, but it, it, but generally I've seen a lot more, especially blacktail the most. Yeah. I agree with that a lot. It's, it's like with a whitetail, you screw up, he's going to remember. And he's going to be like, no, that's 100% a human. And then with a, with a black tail, I've noticed that if you really sell it, you've called them in and they're like, man, well, well, maybe now there's a dough in heat with that buck that's rattling. It's like, I better check it out one more time. <clears throat> it, well, maybe those bucks are fighting again right there with that thing that was not a deer. <laughs> it's like you I, sold them so hard. They're just so convinced that there has to be something they missed. And so they're coming back to really yeah. investigate. So yeah, I, you're right on. It's weird. I feel like um, mule deer are the most curious of the deer species, meaning they're the most like, um, they, they tend to just investigate or stare for a long time. And when they should be running, they're still, an, they're still like, Hmm, what is that? Like their curiosity is there with whitetail. It's like, I don't know what that is, but it ain't something I recognize right away. I'm out, you know, and mule mm -hmm. deer, I've seen them, they'll, you know, they, they, they walk away and then they turn one last time before they go over the hill and yeah. they just look at you <laughs> and they're like, but, but, you know, that's sort of the mule deer thing. And, and I've, I've yeah. also shot my arrow and the mule deer just stand there. Don't even flinch. They just take the hit. Right. They don't even dodge duck weave. And, mm -hmm. uh, and, and especially in the rut time frame. I think they're a little more jumpy yeah. and velvet, but when I look at blacktails, here's what's fascinating to me about blacktail is the way that they just statue up and are so calm. Like of the deer species, I would argue that blacktail are the calmest by a wide margin, at least Colombian blacktail compared to the others in the sense that if they do see something, they're more likely to freeze and wait right. for you to walk by or wait for you to not notice, just, just statue up and they just not move a muscle and you can just walk right by them and then they'll slowly walk away 10, 20 yards yeah. and slink. Like they are very much into stealth in a way that mule deer and whitetail are not. Would you agree? Yes, you definitely agree. And you got to think too, this is all just assumption, but it has everything to do with the terrain and the predators they adapted from. And real quick side story is that when you hunt an axis deer on Maui, they are the most skittish, crazy cracked out deer on the planet because they adapted from like tigers in yeah. India or something like that. <laughs> they are so wired. And then, so whitetail, they have to have adapted, you know, from that type of predator that was, that was uh, so much more aggressive and also in their terrain to be able to be skittish like that. And then moving to mule deer, open terrain. So they, they want to see that second look because they could typically see, right? right. So you got to think the open terrains, giving them that advantage, they can run. And then like, now I want to see what you are. And then a black tail, very brushy jungle, like, so they're used to predators walking by them. So they freeze to like, okay, we're all clear now. So you got to think that that's how they adapted. And as a hunter, you're just like, you're just trying to make the best you can and hunt them based on what you typically understand. And, uh, but you wouldn't necessarily relate that, that they've just adapted to their terrain and their predator in order to have that behavior. And so for blacktail, it does work out pretty good. If you can, uh, if you can sneak in on them, right yeah. there, they don't know that you're, you, that you saw them because there's most of my opportunities are when I catch them moving first and they can even catch my movement and be curious and come on in. But if I stay still and just have some confidence that, hey, if, I, if I'm patient, I'm going to get a shot opportunity. And that's not going to be the case with all of the species. Sometimes yep. it's like, no, it's now or never. But yep. with a blacktail, yep. stay as patient as you can. See what happens. I've had them walk up to eight yards countless times because of a little bit of a sound, a little bit of a movement. After all, they're looking for a doe to breed during that late yep. hunt. Yep. So they might wander right on up to check out what it was. It's thick enough. They can't trust that they would have saw the doe. Maybe the doe's bedded or 
So they're going to come investigate. So that's, that's definitely true. I've noticed. Another thing you said. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh, another thing you said, I didn't really quite touch on is with my film, my film. uh, Thank you so much for the kind words. And it means a lot when you drop those films, you open yourself up to be viewed and to be judged. Right. Yes, you do. And also with my buddies, my close friends, I want to make sure that I'm not stepping on toes by showing places where I hunt. These are very special places to me. So I usually try to make it where it's a really hard, you know, breadcrumb trail to follow. And, but I don't want to ruin anything. And so that's why it's, it's kind of like this nervous feeling to share a film like that when it's a very special hunt to me. But it feels, it, I appreciate it so much that, you know, you value that. I, I get some comments that people value it and they just like to see the animals, right? They just like to know that that type of experience can happen. And it's almost encouraging them like, Hey, if I stick it out, that could happen for me. But one caveat is that I hunt extremely hard. Like I'm putting in the miles, I'm putting in the work. There is, there is a early morning and there's a late night that's on every day that I hunt in order to be out there in the best spot possible during the prime times where I've had the most success, lots of hours in the dark, all of that in order to maybe give myself the best chance of seeing a deer that's active, right? Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of prep. The other thing is that I'm showing the highlights. I like to edit to where somebody doesn't have to necessarily see me talk. Like, I want you to see what I'm talking about. I want to see, I I like to see the action. That's what I want to see in a film. That's how I edit. So don't be confused. It is actually really hard and slow. And it just so happens that I came across some cool moments and I got to experience that. I feel so grateful to have seen it. And that's what that drive, I have a drive in me that just this voice that says, don't, I, I, there's no stop in my head when I'm hunting, when I'm doing anything, there's not like that voice saying, Hey, it's probably good now to just turn it off. It's <laughs> right. like, no, I go, 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 go. And that's why I was a distance runner, because there was not that stop voice in my head. It was just go maybe harder now. Mm-hmm. Um, let's see if we can get over that next Ridge before it gets dark. Wh- I wonder what's there. So that curiosity in me drives me to, to keep trying harder and harder. And then when I edit, it's like, just don't be confused. That was a lot of days. And I might've consolidated a day that I only saw one animal. Uh, but you, I don't want to show you, you know, in an, an, a 10 hour day, uh, that's it during that's- the film, if I saw one animal. So it's like, that's where I'm at. So don't be confused on my films. It's not like that. Oh, yeah. It's nonstop. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it's, yeah. it's not like- uh, Very low density. You could make it, you could really make it look like you're just running in a deer every day and it's hotter than hot, you know? But I would say you struck a good <laughs> balance. You you did a good job of of showing earlier in the season, mid-season, late season, um, walking us through the fact that you've been putting in the time, you've passed on some great opportunities because you were looking for something next level. All of that was, I thought, well captured, well well explained. Okay. The, the story uh, it flowed. And I, what I liked about it was, um, yeah, I didn't feel like it was just a highlight reel. I mean, I felt like, uh, you did a good job of, I don't want to sit there. This is the same thing I, I deal with when I'm making a film too. I want you as the viewer to feel like you're there experiencing it with me. And that means I need to capture the shots of the animal doing the animal things as well as the other angle of, of me interacting with the situation. That's not easy to do. And that's why I applaud you because you're actually getting the animal. The animal is the star of every film in my opinion. And I feel that a lot of hunts, um, you know, for various reasons, and you were self filming a portion of this, it's, it's not easy to film um, the wildlife, especially when you're the hunter and the, and the film guy, like, and, and then you added a bow to it, like props to you, dude. Like there, there is, that's insane. Uh, what you pulled off. It's really cool. And a lot of us, including myself, wouldn't have the patience to pull out the camera in that moment. Cause I'd want to kill the buck so bad. I wouldn't bother, yeah. you know, and that right there is, you know, there's a dedication, a blend there of, I want to capture the film, but I want to do my hunt and, and I want to be successful. Like all those things are, weighing you're weighing out each of those each of those things but um you made a a a very cool story with lots of wildlife footage and i understood what was happening the flow was good but i i still felt like i suffered along with you because it took some time which is that balance right 
uh, to try to, and for me, when I'm showing you a moment, I want to let the wildlife footage breathe. But sometimes, you know, I want you to sit there for five minutes, which is a long time in a 25 minute film, just looking yeah. at the animal like we were. Um, yeah. And so what I've done is I've added some some things to help with like a pop-up that tells you what's, you know, I love that by the whatever. way, because that can kind of carry that slow footage a little bit. It gives your, your brain and your mind and it, it's a good place to add some, some no. good detail for context while you're feeling the slowness of the hunt impact you, you know? So it, it, it's right. a tool I think to help with the pacing of a story being in, in the way that we, we do it. And so I, I feel like yeah, I love your gear, your gear stuff, uh, you know, notes that pop up or even just facts about the wildlife that pop up. Yeah. That's awesome. Like it, I feel like you do it so well, you know, and I would love to include, I, I did it on a blacktail tactics film, include some little bit of like, here's some stats cause I'm a stats kind of guy. Yeah. Uh, but I love that about your films too. So, I mean, you've, you, you, I feel like you are, you know, excelling, you're doing so well at making your films. So that's where I want to go to, to watch your films, to learn about that species and to yeah. see how that hunt goes. And you do that yeah. so well. And then for me, I'm this like archery guy, dude, you're a little film bit is... different <laughs> background. So, but yeah, the... keep going. Sorry. I interrupted, but I wanted you to keep going. No, when I with looked your at your films, you were talking about. Yeah. When I looked at, um, the, the footage that you've assembled, and um it's attractive it's clean footage i can hear it you know as needed i felt like i felt like uh the i i love it i i love that style i think um you know before i started podcasting before i started gritty i was uh i worked for um well i worked for a number of different companies but i i graduated from college from university and i was i did uh, accounting and finance and it security later i was doing sarbanes oxley audits and and uh, revenue assurance audits and one of the the things that i did for about three years was i just created workflow diagrams for businesses for all their business processes mm -hmm. and so it would be visio diagrams and swim lanes yep. and charts and graphics and i would just sort of through a picture show a business how their accounts payable worked, how their accounts receivable worked, how how their shipping worked. And it was like step-by-step step, and where were the controls and decision boxes and so forth and whose roles and responsibilities were what. And over time, I mean, it was my job day in and day out for years for to do this across multiple companies over the years and, and build an entire like like series of diagrams that documented every process in the business. And later when I started watching hunt films, I, I was like, man, I really wish I could see a diagram of what's going on, like a map, uh, some dots, some positions. Like I want some context to this story because I'm the real disadvantage, I think, to hunt film is the lack of that. So, so right. often it's, you end up with the interview, you end up with the animal and just explanations in the form of discussion of what's happening. But really right. it feels like you're looking at the film or the, what's happening yeah. through a little tube. And so you're, you're seeing yep. that buck. Okay. I see the <laughs> buck, but I have no idea really the whole rest of the picture. Cause I can only see that deer and then I can only see your head and, the rest of it, I'm like lost, right? I, I'm not quite exactly yeah. sure. And without that big picture, uh, it doesn't, It I don't feel like I'm quite following fully. I, I'm sometimes confused yeah. or lost. And I'm especially bad at following, you know, someone's explanation of, I just crested this hill and I went through this and the buck is behind this thing. And if he comes out right here, then I'm going to get him. And none of it means anything to me other than I see you and I see the buck, you know, without more yeah. going into it. And, uh, I feel like that's one of those areas that because of my previous job 
and doing all these like, so PowerPoint presentations and so forth mm. that it just sort of naturally flowed into what I do now. And now I, I, as, as I've done it more and more, I feel like it's, it makes the flow of my film so much easier to create because how often do you get into your edit and you're like, I didn't say this thing and I don't yep. have an explanation to, 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 for the audience to follow this transition of what I was here, but now I'm here. How do I tell it? I never said it out there. Do I do voiceover? And then voiceover is tricky. Okay. Voiceover is a whole different <laughs> animal. I hate it. Yeah. And you did great. And that's the thing. I think Ranella does a great job. I could listen to his voiceover yeah. all day. I think Remy Warren right. and Tim Burnett Some people do, do great really jobs. Good. They, they just kind of, it, they good writers. I like how they, they do it. Um, but that right there is, is where you would go in the absence, I think of some sort of graphics or, because you have to explain it or we're just yeah. lost as the viewer. Correct. Yeah, no, you brought up so many good points and uh, like, I want to, yeah, I want to respond to almost all of them if I could, but when you show your graphics, it's like an onyx, it looks like an onyx map, right? And then you show your dots that are your tracks going up and you show your, your icons that looks like an onyx icon right where, where the deer was. And all that flows so good. And I, I like that you guys have really coined that, right? Like you've, you've developed that. That's like a gritty thing and it works so well. And for me, I have a very technical background too, just like you. And, and I see everything and, and kind of figures and presentation, like, right. Um, I like to tell a story too, starting from the very beginning and how we ended up there. But my biggest pet peeve personally for my own edits is to flash to me somewhere else or to voiceover, Right. It's so tough because you're taking your viewer out of the feeling because I'm like a I'm like a feeling guy when it comes to editing. I edit out of how I felt about that hunt. The music I choose, the clips I'm showing, it's like I want to walk you through how I felt. Now, I doubt anybody really connects at that level, but for me when I view it, when I want to show my kids and my family, it's like I'm editing based on like a vibe. So oh, so man. that's how I kind of run my film and my music and you kind of seen that and and I just hope that I said enough at the end of my day or the beginning of my day that can help explain the story. Cause sometimes I don't have that. Right. And then I don't use it. Like if I don't have the backstory, I'm not going to show it on my film and I'm not going to do a voiceover. It's I can't, I maybe did a voiceover at the end, the beginning of a film, just as like a fun little intro, but very, very little. And so I want people to just be able to walk through it with me on how I felt during that time. And even in this most recent film, I'm doing a recap in my first take, I slide and hit the ground and just <laughs> poof. And like, and so I'm like, okay, that's not gonna, that's not gonna work. So I gotta do it again. And I'm like slurring. I watch it later. I'm slurring my words because of how fatigued I was. I was mm. super cold. And yeah. um, it was almost like being intoxicated in the sense that like I can't hardly formulate a sentence. Mm -hmm. And and I'm not like calling that out. Like a, a viewer would have to have noticed that I I screwed up on a couple words or slurred a little bit or was stalling. And that's the real like if you were to watch it and notice on the second to last day, it's it's me hiking out talking about a tough season and my dad just killed a buck. And it's very hard to communicate because of how much grind there was in the day. And so I kind of like that piece. If I was to flash to me sitting in front of a computer talking like, okay, so this is what happened then you're not going to get that same sense or feeling like you're walking through it with me. And, and that's the edit piece. It's just for me doing it myself. Like you said, it's all self film. I, I don't have anybody to point a camera at me. Um, it's, it's, yeah, it's tough to get that whole story. And I like to tell the story from beginning to end. And it's even better when you have to overcome something. And for me this year, it was an incredible battle to overcome just to be out there and hunt. And so I'm just so grateful that I did, I did it and I was able to hunt and not only hunt, but I was wanting to hold out for something I felt good about. Not just like, okay, I'm handicapped. I'll shoot the first buck. It's like, I'm handicapped and I want to shoot the best buck I can come across. Grind second, like two days left of the season and I end up getting my buck. So whew, that was, it felt good. I was pretty emotional when I did my recap at the end. Um, and it just felt so good uh, to work that hard. And then, you know, have a buck that I felt good about at the end. Oh yeah. The, you know, when it comes to, I, I look at kind of to touch on what you just said, I look at the, the tools that go into telling a documentary story. Like this is a documentary film in my mind. Um, 
you're filming it, you're capturing it, you're trying to capture whatever is going on at the moment. You don't know though. It's not pre-decided. Your shot list isn't pre-decided. You're not filming a mm-hmm. commercial. Everything's not like, okay, a f- movie that you're directing. No, these are, these are, this is a different style of, of, of filmmaking when it comes to a documentary. You're just out there running the camera, running a gun and doing a thing, trying to describe what's happening, trying to explain it in the moment, all that kind of stuff. Then you come home and you have a pile of stuff <laughs> and it's a pile raw footage yeah yep. and and now you're going to go through it and go okay where was the microphone audio decent because the wind was ripping here i gotta chuck that where did the video yeah. turn out where it wasn't so shaky the viewer won't vomit okay i got you kind of parse through what you have to work with and then you kind of prioritize it and then you start to assemble a cohesive story and all of that is is takes a tremendous degree to do it well. It takes a cr- tremendous degree of of uh, of effort, and for all the time spent in the field, the viewer is just getting that condensed, tiny package of the final product. Things like um, voiceover to me, um, their voiceover is one of those things that gives someone. It's a tool to use to provide context that comes way after the event is over. And that's great because sometimes hindsight, after you've had a week, three days, a full day to think about it, like you see things a little more clearly or you have a more solid opinion on what what went down, you know? Right. And so I like that tool because I like to hear someone like, you know, Randy Newberger, Remy, or somebody explain to me, Renella, like, okay, I had some time to think about this and this is what was happening and this is who did what, where, when, and how. But as a viewer, I also know this isn't real time, right? That You've taken me out of the moment now as if I'm in the field with you and you've put me in a hindsight position to think about the film or to think about the events later. So when you introduce voiceover to me, it, it, it takes you out of the now live action moment and puts you in a retrospective moment, which is great. It's a great tool. Retrospective is awesome. I, I want to see that part too, but I, I want to see the live action more the, in the moment, like I'm there next to you, breathing the same air, seeing that buck walk out the adrenaline, yeah. your adrenaline, you talking to the camera, the whispering. I want that now. I don't, and I don't want it to be polluted with voiceover in that moment to explain to me what's happening. You know what I mean? Right. That's kind of, yes, I do. but after the buck goes down or even after you're showing like a series of, of highlight reels or clips or explaining some maybe more, more detail, I don't mind voiceover. I would prefer yeah. though an actual in the moment recap. And if you look at hunts, there's a, there's a formula. Every hunter does the same thing. Uh, they shoot the animal. Okay. It, let's say they, they, they shot the animal and they made a good hit and they know they pretty much know they did. Right. There's, there's a after shot, like emotion, like, like whether you're the person who freaks out, like, Eichler and goes nuts or you're the type of person that's really calm and chill. Like I just shot a deer like Lampers, you know, like, Oh, just (laughs) (laughs) whatever though, there is an emotion. He's done it so much. There is a reaction that happens that comes from the person and, and uh, all hunters relate to it no matter what, like there's a, there's a sense of relief. There's a sense of accomplishment. There's a sense of uh, loss in some ways because you just killed an animal but there's also yeah. it's it's juxtaposed with that feeling of I'm going to be able to provide. I have meat. I did the thing that seems impossible. I connected with nature. Something about it awakens in your DNA. You feel some sort of sense of fulfillment and purpose. All those things kind of all at once. We all know it. I mean, you film it. People know it. We all connect with it. Then you walk up on the animal. And everybody has that has hunted. It has that experience of I've seen it. I've watched it. Especially if it's a buck you've been in pursuit of for some time now it's like i just want to hold it like shane mahoney says like every human being wants to go to the level of possession like there is a desire to 
to, you know, hold it and to have it and to make it yours now. And in, in essence, when you take that tag, which legally allows you to hunt, and then you kill the animal, it is now legally yours. It's your property. It's your thing. It's like, it's, it's something in our DNA again, that we all right. are like the, the elusive unobtainable we obtained and, and there is a desire to hold it. And so as a viewer, viewers want to see it. They want to touch it and they don't care if it's big or small. They, they care about you and your reaction to it. They, they want to feel right. what you feel when you, when you're up on it. And and after that, there's almost always a, did you see that? Can you believe what happened? I, it came over here. You just gush out naturally. You don't even, <laughs> you don't even prompt it. Your buddies, you're all standing there and there. It's like, and then he did this and then he did that. And when he came out, he did this and I couldn't believe it. I can't believe it. And it's just this bubbling of discussion that is completely natural. You capture that as a cameraman because it's just, it's natural and real and almost everybody does it. You watch a you watch a hunter after he kills, almost always there's going to be an immediate, did you see that? Oh my gosh, what yeah. happened? Da, 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 this couldn't can't be real. Wh whatever it is. And I did this and I did that. And you just naturally you just tell the story the second it's finished. I don't know why. Yeah. You all do it. And if you capture that, yeah. when you when you play that footage for the audience, it's as real and authentic and as natural as it can be. And when you overlay that discussion with shots from the actual moment of the deer walking out and you make pulling your bow back or whatever, and you making that shot in a slow motion along with the, disc the, the natural interview that you basically gave, you have created a powerful piece of content that reiterates what they just went through live action but now it's retrospect in a way, yeah. but you're not doing voiceover. You're, you're still live. It's like this beautiful yeah. combination in my opinion of the two. And um, I feel like too many hunt shows completely uh, they, they shoot it and then they jump to a montage and music and them standing around it and some kind of sort of romantic, like, and I'm like, no, I just wanted to, I, you, I wanted to just feel like I was there in the most natural sense and replay that moment with you. But it got covered up with emotional music and, 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 and trophy shots, you know? And I, yeah. I, I feel like the, the, but these are just examples to me of, of things that are, of ways to tell your story as a filmmaker. Um, and when I watch your, when I watch your films and I've, I've, I've watched a little progression here as you're continuing to capture cool stuff in a difficult situation, set of circumstances. And I just got to applaud you for grabbing those elements and, and putting it together. And I don't, exp I don't, you know, you're going to be different than me and I'm going to be different than that guy. And I'm going to, and I tried to make this point the other day. Apparently some people were offended because you know i have opinions but i i look at stuff and there are there's a way that i do it and i like the way that i do it but i actually there's there's hunters and filmmakers that that have a totally different style than i do that i also enjoy that doesn't have to be it the point is does it connect you know did it connect right. and with your with your film it really does it's it's well done um and it's, it's not, it's not, it's, it's a different style than it does. It's not, a, it doesn't mim mimic mine. You know, there's elements where we, where we have similarities and then you, then you have the Nathan style. Right. And I think that that, um, that's really, it, it's just, I like that. I like that. I think that it's, it's one of those things where, like I said, you, it's not necessarily the, the tools that you're using. Um, it's, it's the authenticity in the film, capturing the animal, making it easy to understand and follow. Like those are just basic elements and, and they're, they're all there. So uh, anyway, um, back to, thank you so much. You're welcome. Thank you. Thank you for making this cool, cool film. So tell me a little <laughs> bit on the film side of things as you're sitting here and you're trying to film a hunt like this, um, <sighs> you know, how, What's your strategy when you like 
in your mind as you go out to to capture the hunt how are you running the camera what's your sort of your tenets of good filmmaking while you're also trying to hunt yeah great question and i would say in my earlier days like the first films i made those were the ones where when you sit down now to edit you're realizing wow i missed all of this cool stuff that i should have just had a camera on like why did i not have a camera on And so for me, my strategy is that it has to be available. My cameras have to be accessible very quickly. And so I run a fanny pack. Uh, So I have this fanny pack. It's like a Jan sport from Bymart for 12 bucks and it matches the same color of my pack. So I'm, I'm like coordinated Yeah, yeah. and I have a a small handy cam. It's a Sony 4k handy cam. And that's my camera. That's like, things are going to happen in like a half a second. I've got to get this on film. And so it's available, it's accessible. And I realized in that moment that I didn't need an arrow knocked or maybe I had an arrow knocked. Now it's time to get that camera out to capture some part of that story because the story has been ongoing and I just have bits and pieces of it. So the other is that I have to wear a GoPro on my head and that's going to pick up the moving in between things or I need hands free because I might shoot this deer. Uh, So it's, I run it on my head as much as I can, but obviously it's like, you know, bobblehead with the yeah. GoPro on your head. So it's not very comfortable. It's awkward if it's raining and you're trying to wear a hat, something like that. But that's the best way to get hands-free film when you need hands-free. So I'm doing that as much as I can. I have another GoPro that's on a tripod that I'll try to set up if I'm glassing or something like that. So I'm just getting the footage however I can um, in order to help tell that story. And hopefully it turns out because a lot of times I watch the film, I'm like, well, it's too windy or what's that weird clicking noise or man, that was really shaky. Like all of it was so shaky. You can't use any of it. Right. And so all of that edit review, right? So when it comes to the strategy, it's that everything has to be very accessible. I even had my DSLR um, on a monopod stuffed through my, my belt on my pack mm-hmm. so that it could just be like quick and on a tripod because again, shaky footage is not useful. It's like, so it has to, I can't just pull out my DSLR and be like shaking vigorously because I'm a cold. It might be super windy and rainy. And also I'm really nervous because there's bucks in my lap or whatever, but I want to get that type of view that adds more of the uh, cinematography that I would hope to show in my content. You do so well at it because you have really nice cameras and you're filming for someone. So like I have one film now soon to be two that I'm dedicated cameraman. And those films are light years better, in my opinion, because I get to focus on getting all those cool shots, the wildlife that like the small little birds um, that are that uh, are coming in close. And it's like, oh, if I had my camera out, I'd film that. That's kind of a pretty view and cool wildlife, you know, and but you can't do that when you're hunting because you had your bow in your hand. So that that's kind of the the rub there with self-filming. And I want to have something that's very interesting to capture all wildlife, not just when it's when it's game time, you're going to shoot or, or like the bucks in your lap. I want to capture all those little details that make the hunt special. This hunt that I do, Brian, it is very special. My grandpa used to go up in these areas that I hunt. I mean, clear back, uh, like 1940s, he started taking my dad when my dad was a kid, my dad took me as young as I could go. So like, there is such a beautiful aspect to me about the rugged terrain, the wildlife that live there and survive there. And if I could somehow pull that together to make somebody feel like they're walking through it with me, I feel like I've accomplished my job because I'm sharing something very, very special and home to me. And so I, again, when you, you know, you identified with some of this stuff, I appreciate that so much because that is my goal, right? I want to inspire and encourage people, promote hunting and conservation, and also like to show this side of something that otherwise people may never experience or see or know it's out there. And this is my special home turf hunt, that high country hunt. So that's kind of the strategy in cameras is I run a bunch of cameras. I try to get every possible detail I can, and I am always missing something. And you just make the best of it when you go to edit. It's a tall order, Nathan, to self film, you know, especially a bow hunt. I was self-filming my bow hunt in Arizona a couple of years ago when I shot that mule deer buck. Um, and I was kind of filming it myself the whole time. And, yeah. and when I got in on a stock, you really didn't get much film because I was in the middle of a stock, you know, a GoPro on my forehead could help 
something where I have hands-free opportunity for self family is kind of a must. I decided on that hunt, I was going to do my best though to try. And, and I did have Brad for a few days. So I had some footage to leverage where I had a, a guy running a camera or I was running the camera for Brad, which helped the film flow a lot better. When it comes down to just me by myself, you know, filming and then filming the animal and it's a bow hunt, lots of pieces of the story get dropped. Lots of close encounters and over the shoulder content doesn't get captured. That's, that's a hard, that's a tall order. And it's a, it's a, I've, as I tried it in years past, it's hard to make the film compelling. It's hard to make the film fun to watch as a viewer. One of the things that you, you, if you watch a lot of my film, you know, it's mostly, I, I need a subject to film for the story to be as interesting. It's not that cool when I set up a camera and I film myself row, rowing a boat in Alaska and you just see my shoulders and up. But if I film Ryan rowing a boat, you it, it's like the viewer has so much more of a, a perspective. Context. Yep. When I film Ryan sneaking up on a moose and I'm right behind him and, and I can film that, that's a lot more interesting than when I film myself sneak up on a moose. Right. There's, yeah. you get such a, it's, again, you're watching the video through a toilet yep. paper roll, you know, there, there's, yeah. there's, it's so much more difficult. And so by having, first of all, by doing a rifle hunt, I can self film a rifle hunt much more easily than I can a bow hunt. Right. Because I can actually get that stock a little more on film. I can set up the camera before the shot. I mean, I'm kind of self filming often. Yeah like with the caribou or the moose. It, but when I do have Ryan there, I can say, grab the camera and at least point it where it needs to be pointed. Imagine if I was trying to self film this <laughs> coos hunt and just kill this buck. I, I, I don't know how I'd get that on film without some. It's secondary. like, how would it turn out? Exactly. It's just I'm sitting here. I, I'm trying <laughs> to shoot, but it doesn't hold still. So when it comes yeah. down to bringing a story to an audience, um, a self-filmed bow hunt is, I think, the pinnacle of difficulty. Pinnacle, and um, and to make it compelling and interesting at the same time, I think is is when you're done with it, that's a that's a feat. You know, I've seen that I've seen Remy Warren and Tim Burnett pull it off with solo hunter episodes, and they probably some of the better self-filmers I've ever seen. Yeah. Sometimes I'm like, dude, these guys have insane patience getting this bow kill on film. Like that's nuts. And often, <laughs> often it doesn't happen. Right? That's how like I feel. On, on your hunt, yeah. you know, you don't quite get that one moment. And in my Arizona mule deer hunt, I didn't get the actual kill. And yet the yeah, audience, I remember that one. they didn't seem to care. They were like, look, I got your emotion. I knew the story. Yeah. I, I knew the the grind. I felt like I was there in that one moment they didn't see, but I tried to recreate it the best I could with still shots and silhouettes and movements and a recap of, of uh, in the moment of what happened. And uh, people seem to appreciate it. But like I said, you're trying to do the hardest thing there is to do, I think, which is a archery self-filmed hunt over the shoulder, close encounter type stuff. Um, yeah, it's tough. It's tough. And so when, when you were saying, um, were you done? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I, don't, I hate interrupting, but, uh, so like when you're saying, we're talking about Remy and solo Hunter and, you know, I watched those back in the day and I remember there was an episode with Remy having a late mule deer hunt and he was like trying to set up his tripod. He's showing him set, showing himself, like set it up with the camera on it. And he's like, turns the camera and then he's like getting ready and the buck like leaves the frame. So he's like back there at the camera, turning the camera to try to get it back in frame. And I think on that one, he didn't get that particular buck and it was a monster. And in my mind, it's like, I would have shot that buck. <laughs> like hands down, oh, that totally. buck would be dead right now. I'd be holding I'm like, thinking, check out this buck. Yeah, the whole time I'm thinking, uh, Remy, get no the way. camera, just shoot the buck and then film it later and we can talk about it. I would have burnt that camera. <laughs> um, anyway, so for me, I know that. I know that going into the hunt that I may not capture the shot on film. Mm -hmm. So why would I watch a film? Cause yes, I'm a little disappointed if I don't see how like the golden moment went down. Yeah. It's like, I want to know how it went down, but I can still do that. I can still like show someone leading up to that moment. And then I can still replay and show all the evidence that it all took place in the best way I could. I can. And like, like you were talking, you know, I, 
I tried my best in this film to kind of replay it. And it was a little tricky, but I, I want to do my best to try so hard to capture what had happened, what went down, even mm-hmm. though I couldn't get that exact moment on film. And so while I might be a little disappointed if I don't get to see the shot on film in some hunts, for me personally in editing, I want someone to be so happy with their time spent watching whatever they did watch that it overpowered or made it like dismiss the fact sure. if I didn't actually get that one shot on film. Absolutely. Because to me, again, it's the collective story. And I, I I look at the YouTube algorithm, see where viewers drop off and see that they like the it it spikes where action the action happens, right? On your YouTube analytics. And and so I understand that. But still, for me, I want the viewer to enjoy the experience, to enjoy the story, try to communicate that. You do such a good job at it. So you get to see those same. Yeah. Yeah. To me, the education, there's two things going on here. The education part of it, like how did you do it, mm-hmm. right? That's, that's what I'm trying to impart with the audience often is, is, is the education part how we did it. And if I can show you that I, I followed this buck in AZ for like 16 days straight, I relocated him probably 12 out of 16 days. I put stocks on him multiple times, but backed out when I couldn't, couldn't close the deal. So he never knew I was there, came back, found him the next day. Like I wanted to walk you through the whole thing. So you could see end to end how it all happened. That's what you did essentially with your hunt. You did the same thing. So I was I learned from your experience uh, in c- never quitting, how you went through through it. You knew later in the season it was getting harder and harder. Snow was getting deeper and you're like, I don't know, maybe it won't happen, which makes this second part that I'm about to make so much uh, point I'm trying to make is so important is I told this to B- Brian Barney the other day. He, we, we were hanging out on the mountain last June at the uh, Western uh, hunting summit with lampers. And I was showing some film and, and he said, man, I love your quality of film. I love the storytelling. This was amazing. I loved it. Even though it wasn't a bow hunt because he's all bow hunting all the time. He's like, I still love it because it's so well told. And he's like, I wish my stuff was filmed and, and told that well. And I said, uh, Brian, I, I get it at the same time. I'm going to watch everything that you, that is put out of you hunting because you never fail to do the impossible. The accomplishment is as important as the film, I, th- I think. And too often you have guys that film well, but don't have a very remarkable accomplishment. And you shot a fork and horn, you know, on day three. And it's like, I'm not discounting that. Um, as nothing, but it's not, that's a much more, much more doable task than for example, what you pulled off with the mature blacktail. When you're talking about uh, some of these bucks that Brian Barney has taken, I'm looking at it going, he did it again. Look at that thing and where he did it. And it it was 10 days and it was like, man, that guy. And I am tuning in because of the accomplishment in conjunction with the film. And I'm very, I'm going to, as a viewer, I'm going to be very forgiving on the video quality and the edit and so forth. If you shot a 210 inch buck with your bow on a public land hunt with an OTC tag, you, you bet your ass. I'm going to sit there and watch that. (laughs) And, and it can be missing all sorts of parts of it. Um, And I'm still going to watch it because the accomplishment is so important. And I think a right. lot of guys out there trying to make film don't realize how much that matters to the audience, that the accomplishment right. is, does matter. It, it's, we can all, we've all been on hunts and it's fun to just go on a hunt and to see a guy take an animal and then be done. There's something about the fact that the way that you set for yourself an unattainable type goal or a very difficult one and then achieved it. And you took me on that journey through the film. So I'm like, Hey, forgiveness granted, you know, it doesn't have to be perfect. You did the impossible and I got to see it. So I think it's a blend of, of all those things that makes a, a film compelling. You, you know what I mean? Yeah, I do for sure. Uh, 100%. And, and as filmers, as hunters, there's no guarantees, right? right. We, we set out for this goal. We know very, very well, like, think about it this way. What if I had hunted that whole season? You're watching my film and then it comes that last day and it's like, oh, 
I saw that big buck again and he dipped out on me. The end. end, (laughs) It's like, yeah, it's like, (laughs) that's more likely this scenario. Like if I had to put money on my season, put money on myself, I would have said, yeah, that was the outcome probably. But you know, the fact is, is that we don't quit right as hunters and as people who, who love and are obsessed with what we do, we grind it to the end, the very end. And that's why you're talking about, uh, was it Barney? You said, Mm -hmm. yep. Um, Brian yeah, Barney. I mean, he's successful, Brian, he's successful because he grinds to the end and he knows that if he depends on himself, if he trusts in himself, and if that story in his head is saying, you got this, you just have to not quit, keep grinding, you, you pull it out. And then that's why all that film was worth it when you're, right. you know, oh. throughout the season or else otherwise it's just going to get shelved on a hard drive and say, well, maybe, you know, I have maybe a ton next of, time I'll get it done. <laughs> I have a ton of film uh, and I have some some hunts from Arizona and some other places that I've filmed archery stuff, elk as well, where it was epic. I have some pretty cool footage to um, yeah. down to the wire and people have never seen the videos because it was 10 days of grind, 12 days of grind. And in the end we didn't get anything. And so yeah. do I make a movie out of it? And that's unfortunately how a lot of archery hunts work and especially self-filmed archery hunts. Um, yeah. Because they are tough hunts. I'm not doing some guided you know, private land situation either. It's blue collar stuff. And so what I want to show is it can be done. And when it does happen, it's a highlight, one of the highlights of your hunting career, right? Each time. And I want to right. capture it best I can and share it with, with people. But like you said, more often than not, that's it. It ends in, and when you set up for yourself a, a real challenge, it, it ends in, uh, in, in um an unpunched tech and that's just that's just yeah. life and the better i the better hunter i get the more i opportunities i get the better i'm getting at making that happen but still it's it's uh you know lampers has filmed a few hunts he went with jason phelps a number of times and so far they've not oh i think he did get a little five by five bull the younger bull on one of the hunts but for what they saw and 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 you know they they haven't come through like they would really like to. And on, on my end, uh, same thing. I've, you know, Ryan did get a film a, a bull elk that came right up to like six feet and he shot it in the chest. Um, I mean, it was epic over the shoulder footage and really cool hunt. Uh, there's a few outliers, but the majority of the films haven't turned out because the thing didn't happen. And, uh, yeah, that's, yeah. that's, that's, you're right. You're absolutely right. That's hunting. But the the trick I think as a, as a filmmaker, Brad, Brad's been learning this as I've been, um, working <laughs> more is you have to assume that this time it's going to work this time hmm. it's going to happen. Today's the day, because if you don't, you stop turning yep. on the camera and then yep. you get home and you're like, you, you, let's say you finally do it and the camera wasn't rolling. You have to always, every day, you have to stay foot on the pedal with that camera. Like you said, have it accessible, pull it out, even though you don't want to, and really just do it every single time thinking now's the time. Um, because otherwise yeah. you do come home and nothing happened. That's right. And you reminded me of something. So yes, you have to assume that today's the day and you have to tell that, that story when in filming, but even as a hunter, so as a hunter, when you're out and you're hunting, you have to assume, especially in the blacktail woods, that if I see a flash of an animal, this is potentially a shooter buck, right? So you always have to assume that this could be that one in a hundred bucks that I will see this whole season that is a shooter. That's a great buck, like the deer of a lifetime. So you're always ready. So one of the things I like preach to guys is you can't have any excuses. Like you can't be wearing gloves necessarily, even if it's, you know, like, uh, raining, uh, if it's raining and 35 degrees is kind of like my worst condition out there because yeah. you're soaked and it's not snow bouncing off. You're soaked, you're soaked yep. and it's nearly freezing. So I don't wear gloves. My hands at times are chalky and they don't hardly move. And I'm like, you know, constantly putting them in my mouth, to try to warm up my finger so I could squeeze the release. Cause that's all I need to do. It just has to, it just has to feel <laughs> heavy. I just have to kind of feel it Yeah, yeah. and, and I can make a shot. And so I don't want to have gloves on. I don't want to have clothing that's, you know, like rubbing and making a noise because it won't give me that edge. 
There's so many things that I could say about no excuses. Everything from, did you eat a really big breakfast so that you didn't necessarily have to stop that day? Mm -hmm. Because if you stop Mm -hmm. and get cold and you're all stiff, you're like, oh, I feel stiff and it's been a good day. Maybe I'll just hike out now, you know, or it's been a rough day. I'm just going to hike out to the truck and I probably won't see anything. I didn't even see a buck all day. And then boom, you blew it because in that next hundred yards, you just jumped the biggest buck of your life that was bedded below a tree because he didn't want to rut. It was just storming too hard. And then that was your opportunity if you had been going slow. And so there's all these things like to boil down to say, you can't have any excuses. Mm -hmm. And it comes the same thing with filming. Can't have any excuses. You have Mm -hmm. to have everything accessible and ready to go. So with me and hunting, the only reason I feel like I could pull this stuff off is because I just kind of have to grit it out. And I don't have that voice saying, this is dumb. Like, why are you doing this? It's like, no, this is what I live for. I've been doing it since I was like able to walk. So this is, I mean, I live for it. Yeah. Almost it's, like the suffering is worth it. You yeah. know, it's, you've oh, yeah. talked about it a lot. It, it's like, yeah. it's like with, uh, it's like when you're hunting with somebody and there, there's a, there's the, the moment is, you know, you're on a pinch point, they're rutting over here and the dude doesn't have an arrow knocked. He's just sitting there. And then the animal comes walking over and now he's trying to get the arrow ready. It's like that, that, like that I'm always, and Ryan is exceptional at this thinking <laughs> 10 steps ahead. Okay. If this happens, this yeah. happens. I got to have the arrow ready. I got to have the release here. I got this. I got the check checklist. Boom, 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 boom. Yep. If the moment presents itself, boom, I got it. Everything's all the, the T's are crossed and the I's are dotted. Th- that sort of thing. Uh, no excuses. It does surprise me how many fellas aren't successful because they got their gloves on, like you said, and then they got to take those off in the wrong moment, you know, so they can take that shot. And it's like, if they just didn't have the gloves on and be a dead deer. And I, yeah, I honestly, exactly. I, I feel like that has been one of the main reasons why I've, I, I'm, I'm been successful. Ryan's successful in those moments is because we're, we're so committed to the end goal that we're not going to sacrifice the opportunity for success for, let's say comfort or just, you know, negligence. It's not going to happen. Right. Few times it has throughout our lives, of course, but you learn from those and you're like, okay, no more. That's, that's exactly, I wanted to trail you and say, yes, exactly. And I think that and I was going to kind of ask you that, but I think that so much of it has to do with experience, time in the woods, failing. Like if you went out and it just worked out beautifully, you're not going to really develop those skills that are that internal checklist, the intuition that says, I know what I'm doing every step of the way. And if you're not, you're not even at that point, there's, you don't need a reminder. There's nothing. It's just automatic, right? You are going to make it happen. And, uh, and that, that's exactly right with like still hunting blacktail. What I do, there is so many internal like lessons learned that have taught me to be ready in that moment. And so a lot of times I don't have time to range because I've learned that if I make any movements, this buck's going to see it and he's not going to be ready or I'm not going to be ready to make the shot. So yeah. sometimes I'm from practice and experience, you're ranging yep. and then you got it all ready to go. Buck stops, you draw back the rest is history. So, um, I think that failure and years of experience. So when guys are saying, man, I just wish I could get a buck like you, I just want, it's gotta be the spot. It's like, well, you know, I've just failed a lot. I've just been out struggling. Right. And eventually, you know, it just kind of fell into place. And then pretty soon you build that momentum. I always tell guys too, it's cumulative. So your effort is cumulative. The first few years were pretty hard. You built on it. And then every year after that, you just keep building and building and building. And pretty soon, um, things can still go wrong. You could still screw up, but more often than not, you're going to get this. You yeah, got yeah. it. You know, um, yeah. your videos here. I'm just looking at your YouTube page. Oh yeah. And kind of scrolling yep, through it. There they are. And uh-huh. Nathan, I mean, this Arizona mule deer over the counter, really cool. Oh, I love that the forky you have this, you know, I got one this year. No, or 22. I got nice. one in 22. Yeah. Where's the, where's the super film old buck. It's not dropped yet. <laughs> it's still on hard drive. <laughs> I, I made a film of my dad recently okay. and I haven't shared it. 
So it's a sheep hunt. My dad drew a sheep tag in Oregon and that's taken, that took like months to develop that film. And it's, I was a dedicated cameraman and nobody's seen it yet. Um, just a select few and it's going to be on the full draw. So, uh, oh, that's what took all my time. And now, now I'm getting, yeah, now I'm getting on to the other stuff. <laughs> Cause I'm looking through your videos here and, and you have some from three years ago, three years ago, two years yeah. ago, uh, <laughs> a year ago, um, 10 months, yeah. five months, three months, two weeks. And you've got some, this, there's a couple of nice black tails. This, the, the beauty of this from two years ago, this one, uh, black tail deer, uh, Oregon over the counter, uh, from two years mm, ago, 35,000 cool. views. That's yeah. a pretty boss, he's man. Um, he's the Wenaha bull, your Kodiak yeah. Island. So you've got a lot of this yeah. film stuff here and we need more people to follow Nathan, by the way, you've got 3,000, <laughs> uh, no subscribers <laughs> over 3000. So folks uh, that are listening, you need to go out and subscribe to Nathan's, uh, YouTube channel, which is Nathan Endicott. And then we'll put a link in the description field of the podcast, but we need to get, we need to get you, uh, more followers, more people tuned in. I, I just think a lot of people don't know. And you're, you're also in the pursuit of the species that very few people actually actively obsess over and follow when they go for right. mule deer. Or, or I mean, for, for blacktail. Yeah. Um, but some of the, it's, it's, it's a cool mountain hunt. Don't think of it as blacktail. Just think of it as, I mean, it, some of these look like just mule deer, dude. Um, and then you've got a few, uh, looks like, um, other species in here and you got some elk and some bear as well. So awesome stuff. How long have you been filming and who taught you how to do it? Yeah, that's so, okay. So my Endicott films is more recent, I would say. And that's kind of like nudge, nudge from really good friends like John Luziak uh, through W Design yep. Company. He kind of was like, nudge, nudge, you need to take it like next level. And I'm like, I'm really happy with my level and where I'm at. But let's just say that like Grandpa Endicott, he laid the framework for Endicott's filming. He, th I have just right over here, I have a box full of like 300 slides from, from Grandpa Endicott phenomenal photos, like photos that I can hardly take with my equipment now, just beautiful, great photos. And he filmed and he filmed too. And I, there's these old reels that I don't, we no longer have, unfortunately, but he was filming way back then. So my dad from early, early on always had access to a fairly nice camera. And then later on when digital cameras came out, it's almost like things downgraded, but were more accessible and easy to use. And so dad was always filming. I've got all this old high eight film that yeah, I've burned I too. and have it electronic and I've released a little bit of it, but it's so hard to watch, yeah. you know? Um, but so that right there. And then, so dad would hand me down his camera. So as soon as I was shooting a bow and hunting, I was also filming. I have all of it. It's just so hard to view. Right. And I was making films from the time I was probably 14, 15 years old on my, well, a little bit after that, I would say probably 17 when I got a computer and I started making films and burning them to DVDs. I have yep. a stack of DVDs of all these old films I made that have like my favorite music of choice back in the day, copyrighted <laughs> yeah, yeah. music. Right, it's right. like rock, ACDC, <laughs> all that crap. Yeah. And you can't share it anywhere. And so I did that for years and years and years. And finally, I just got to the point where I'm like, well, this is not very easy to view. It's hard. It's not accessible. I want my kids to grow up watching my hunts. And it's like, I wish so badly that my grandpa had a YouTube. How epic would have that yeah. been? Well, you're yeah, making that's that one. one buck. He's so pretty. You're, you're making that's a, a cool YouTube buck. channel. You're showing people these videos. I mean, <laughs> it's just so, the, it's so just, yeah, grandpa. Yeah. So then dad and then, you know, but dad, it's not accessible. It's old, hard to watch film. So for me, like having all this history, um, with my family, I just, I, I like owe it to them to maintain the heritage and to place it somewhere that could be viewed by my family, like more or less forever right? Yeah. As long yeah. as this hard drive that I have doesn't, you know, get burnt up or something like that or crash, like my, my kids have access to it. And I, I feel like that is the meaning I've won when my kids say, daddy, I want to go shoot a bear or a deer. Like they do yeah. that all the time. Every night, my daughter right now, every night for the past two weeks, I said, daddy, tell me the story about your second bear. Like not the first <laughs> one, not like the, like your second one. Cause I already did the first one the night before. They're like, daddy, tell me the story of your third buck or the buck with yeah, mommy. Yeah. 
And like, so I tell her those stories and she only knows that because, well, A, they're all over on my walls and B, they watch my films. Right. Totally. And so that right there is a win. Okay. Yeah, I don't Ryan, care if I have 3000 subscribers or 80,000 yeah, subscribers on YouTube. I agree. To me, my value comes in my kids enjoying hunting and me carrying on that legacy. That is so meaningful to me, right? Like while yeah, I yeah. have ambitions to be the best I can at everything I do, it's like for me, those kids and maintaining the legacy and the heritage I have with the Indicots, that that's my win. Dude, yeah. uh, long, you know, long answer. When Sorry. I did a video, when I started doing videos with Lampers, I was at his house and his wife, Hillary, was sitting there and the kids and they were like, he has spent his life out there and we have no idea what it's like when he's out there. It's There's a few photos. That's it. He's just out there and then he comes home. She's She said something to the effect that now she gets to go on these hunts with him in a way when when she sees these movies and she sees what it is that drives him and, and makes him love it and what sort of struggle it is to pack a moose out, let's say, to, and, all, and, 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 and a big mule deer in the mountains and yeah. all of those things. And that's what film does. It changes everything. The, the way people can, the way people, let's say they view hunting or, or let's say blacktail hunting, a film like what you're producing can completely change someone's idea of it. I feel like with bear hunting, we, years ago, we started, we, 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 we did not see films out there that adequately captured what bear hunting is, what it's all about, what it's like in the spring, in these mountains. Our goal was to show it to people so they would value it. Like without the film, people dismissed it. Nah, you can't even yes. eat it. You can, and it's delicious. Ah, why would I want to? I don't want to hunt over bait. You don't. You you glass, you spot and stalk in pristine wilderness. Like, you know, all of that, it took uh, the films to, I think, to, like show it yes. to people. And the same thing Absolutely. I think is true with the coos deer stuff that we've been working on. I think many people have dis dismissed it or not been interested in it because they haven't quite seen what it really is, what what the desert's like, how cool the the, the animal is, and I feel like the same thing with the blacktail. Um, the way you're capturing it gives the, gives that viewer a, a second look at that species as an option. Going, wait a minute, wait a minute that was really cool. I, I could actually, I, I actually want to try that where without your film, it just, it, the vision isn't caught. It's not understood. It's not grasped until I started watching yeah. people hunting tar in New Zealand and, right. and red stag and fallow. I had no interest in it whatsoever. But when I saw some of the mountains and the tar and the chamois coming down and the stalks and the rugged terrain, the, the, the weather, I'm like, I got to do it. I got to do it. And that's where film is powerful. It, it, it changes people's entire perspective on, on the world and it changes their perspective on, on hunting too. So you have all those non hunting people who come along and, and are fascinated by the way you've captured the wilderness and what a bow and arrow in your hand does when you're out in the mountains of Oregon. And it's like, Oh, Oh, I, Okay, this is this is not just a guy shooting something just to shoot it. This is a, a holistic experience, getting touch in touch with you know nature and God and primitive world and what it means to be human at the core. And so right. I think all of that is is uh, why film is powerful, like what you were saying. So if now you don't go, you you've been doing it, oh, it sounds for say, a long time yeah. and. Yeah, a long time just recently to make it into a viewable when you, film. When you what what but how did you go from like is someone helping you with the edits? Are these all Nathan edits? Like wh where are you pulling from? Good question. Just lots of self-taught stuff or where is it coming from? Good question. So it's kind of a uh, evolution, I would say. Um cuz everything that I do with exception of one film was so our Kodiak film that was a full draw film tour submission. So we paid somebody. We paid uh, Michael Cheriker, and he's a really nice guy. He's done some work in the industry. And so my dad paid him to edit the Kodiak film. And that was submitted to full draw, and they got to tour it in 19. 
but I believe the full draw was not open to public view. It went to YouTube. That was the first year. So unfortunately, it was kind of a very low viewership year because you had to select the film to watch it. Um, right. But that's the only one. All the rest are uh, edited by me. And it was a big learning curve over time. And also, I can't justify spending money nope. on 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 edits or film or anything. My, my cameras. Because you can't afford a cameraman to follow you around. You can't afford it. I mean, that's what <laughs> happened afford to me. A cameraman. I'm like, if I'm going to do this, I have to teach myself. And it's going to be a slow, long yes. grind. Exactly. And, and also it's like, yeah, when it comes down to buying that $3,000 camera or spending it on your home and your wife and your kids, it's going to go to my priorities. Right. And so that's why I mean, that's what I mean by evolution is that I started with the most basic everything's at my first couple films, right? The cheapest things I got my hand on, whatever I could do to tell the story, just because I wanted to start somewhere, you know, using YouTube studio to find the music, just so basic, basic. And then, and then like, you know, someone contacted me and said, Hey, I love what you're doing. Um, here's some of my music. You can use it copyright free. And, um, or, uh, just so that it doesn't get flagged on YouTube, I'll, I'll whitelist you or whatever they called it. And so that stepped it up and that was Justin Ruth, super nice guy. And then it kind of snowballed like, Oh, well, I want a nicer camera. So I bought a nicer camera and then just kind of kept working up within my means because it's like goals without a purpose like are basically useless. Like what's your goal? Well, my goal is to tell a story and to share it somewhere. Okay. If that's your only goal, then why would you overspend on your equipment? You don't even know how to use that equipment yet. And so then my goal was like, well, I want to make a better film. Now I need better camera quality. So now I can justify that purpose is now I need better quality. Better quality means more expensive camera. And now I can justify buying it because my my support comes from my wife and saying that, no, I think I love what you do and I want you to buy that nicer camera. Like, so, you know, you incrementally work up and eventually yeah. you get to the point where you're able to buy. I just work with Final Cut um, mm -hmm. Pro and, and that was recent. I was using iMovie way longer than Ooh. I should have been and <laughs> export things from Keynote, like using Keynote for some yep. animated graphics and export it to try to get more, you know, frames viewable. Yep. It was a mess. And, but I did it. And some people may not even known that I was using, you know, free software. That was some probably do if you use it, but then to jump up to final cut. Now it's like the sky is, you know, there's no limit, you know, the sky's the limit. So that's how I feel about where I'm at with where I'm going is that now if I want to do it, it's a Google search away. Right. Yep. For me. And I was a distance runner, uh, for a lot of years, I was, I was, I was decent at it. It was probably my best athletic event is to be able to run, uh, endurance races. And so for me, when I discovered that every single time I laced up and went outside, I was better. It was like this click, this switch in my brain saying that you could do anything. Like mm -hmm. there's no limit, Nathan, to what you can eventually do. And eventually you did hit a limit in mm -hmm. some of your activities. Running was one of those things where I never really hit a limit. I'd get hurt. And then I have to reset. And then you start back, but there was really no limit. And yeah. I was learning that there's these runners in another part of the country that their cardiovascular system only improves up to 40 years old. I'm like I'm far from that age. So I'm going to keep getting better. And so I did, and I would do these endurance races. I did a couple ultras. I've ran with cam up the hill. Um, you know, and I, I got a bow in that way. And, and by the way, I owe so much to cam cam took me to Pisgah for the first time I was in the bow rack. He comes in, I was like 10 years old. And he was telling me Tanner, his son was running marathons with him. And I'd never even ran like three miles in my life. <laughs> and he's like, Oh, Tanner, you know, he's going to go with Pisca. You want to go? I don't know. You probably can't beat Tanner. And so I was like 10 and he was, he always grinded <laughs> with me like that. And he's so fun. And so, uh, he invited me to go my first time ever really running. Mm -hmm. Like I've run with my dad, but that was just like a jog to get ready for my dad. Wanted to make sure I didn't die on a hunt, yeah, yeah. but this was like, we were going to run as hard as we could. And Cam took me out and like by some miracle, I made it up to the top faster than it's ever been done. Like by anyone he knew. And I was like a 10 year old, like this small little kid and had this, I just had this like switch in my brain again. That was like, you're going to put me on something. I'm going to do it until I drop or there's no stop. Right. And you put me on a hill. Nothing's telling me to stop. And so flash forward years later, Dad asked Cam if I can get a job at the local utility. Cam sets me up with a labor job, laying pipe in a trench. The guys are talking to me about engineers and water utility. And 
I go to school for it. I get a job in it. I like, I attribute that to Cam, like really. And then he saw me one time at a summer barbecue and was like, yeah, you've gotten, you've gotten a couple animals this year. You know, it's like, it seems like things are starting to kind of like work out for you. And it like set this fire under my butt of like, no, I've been doing a long time. Like <laughs> you just now are noticing that I killed like, uh, I'm like, so I worked a little harder and like, I've been on a streak with blacktail. It's gosh, I don't know, since 2011. Oh, oh. And, uh, so, I mean, again, it's like, I owe a lot to cam. I owe a lot to the community I grew up in of hunters sure. and bow hunters and encouraging people. Um, even the hard times I've gone through, I have such a tight knit community of hardworking people that encourage me to go out and pursue, you know, and then again, at home between my dad and my wife and other family members and friends, like, you know, you depend on these structures. Like I can't say that anything I do is solely me because I've, I've just been so shaped by these people around me. And that gets all the way into my edits. And my dad encouraged me, no, I like your edits. Like, don't change it. Just keep doing what you're doing. And like working on a sheep film, it's like, no, just edit. Don't edit how you see others doing it. Just edit the way that you always edit your films. And I was like, all right. And so I feel like it's one of my best films to date. And you'll get to see that here sometime soon. Um, and it's, my dad's very passionate, right? Like, did you see his podcast with Cam? Not yet. Have you seen um, that? Not, not yet? yet. Not yet. So I'm looking forward to it. Yeah. He's, he's passionate. Like <laughs> I'm passionate, but he's really passionate and, but he owns an archer shop. He's, he's telling, yeah. he's living this story that he's sharing yeah. about. Yeah. So he's very, it's, it's his life, very passionate about it. And so like, when I get to show that on the sheep film, it's just, uh, I hope others receive it as well as, you know, I do, or Cam watched it. I got a text from Cam, Cam and I talk, but like, it was like a two pager. He said the sweetest thing. He's like, you're such a badass, keep it up. And it was like a couple pages long and like to come from Cam and he, he's so busy. He was starting his podcast. He didn't, that doesn't further his podcast to text me that he didn't owe it to me. I haven't done anything to help him necessarily. Like he's encouraged me at times. But that's what I'm talking about when I say that edits are not just solely me. However, I'm moving the mouse and I'm using the program. It's like there's all these people, these support structures that are in my life that help me do what I do and do it well. Yeah. And uh, just the encouragement. You know, I'd never leave to go to Arizona if my wife didn't say, I got these kids for, <laughs> for the week you're going to be gone. Like who? My wife is a pro, you know, like well, she's got the kids and yeah. You know, Nathan, as I'm was looking at all this, no, it was great. <laughs> I love it. I love it. I, it just gives me goosebumps actually. I'm looking through all this film. Like I said, you, you need, you need more exposure. There should be more than 3000 followers. This is, you're making solid content and these films are, are just a pleasure. So I'm looking forward to seeing the rest of what you have coming out. And the next time you do a drop, we should do a podcast and tell people, uh, Hey, Nathan just dropped a new film. Um, you don't want to miss it. So I think right here, I'm looking through this. If you were to stack these films up and give me, tell me, okay, there's because there's usually two metrics. Okay, what film in this lineup that you've created so far is the film that is the most, uh, that you are the most proud of or that you like the most? A combination of probably the achievement as well as the edit together. Blend them like, what's what's the one you're like, yeah, go watch that. Or that's the one that means a lot to me. And then which film is the one that the audience has said, basically, in your mind, this is our favorite? Because they don't always overlap. Sometimes I throw a movie out and I'm like, gosh, you got like 100,000 views on this one over here and I got 20 on this one. But my favorite is this one over here with 35,000 views. But they like the half a million over here. Like which one is the one that uh, for you is, is special and which one is, is the audience kind of responded the most to in your mind? It's kind of a tie between two films, um, three. <laughs> so my Winoha hunt, you know, that took a lifetime to draw. It, I was, it took 20 years. Um, the audience also kind of agrees, I would say, in terms of views. It's not my best edited film. I was using very rudimentary everything. Uh, I think what's special about it is that I got to do the hunt with my dad. It's a hunt I waited 20 years to draw. My dad previously had drawn this hunt. It's the Winaha unit in Oregon. It's the hardest to draw tag. Did it with my bow. I did it with my dad there with me. And there's such a feeling of family in that hunt. 
starting even back in the day before the draws, my grandpa would go hunt it, pack into wilderness areas. And I've been in there with my dad when he drew. There's such a history there. And while a lot of people enjoy elk hunts as opposed to maybe even like, you know, a bear hunt or something like that, it's like the elk hunts where people are drawn, it's still, it's a good, it's a good enough film that captured that experience. And it's, gorgeous. Um, it's very meaningful. Yeah. And it's a good bowl. It's a pretty good bowl. And we did get it on film, two views. I, yep. My dad was videoing and had GoPro. So, so I'd say collectively, it's a good film. It has an open a body and a close to it. Uh, mm-hmm. It has all the components. I would say there wasn't a lot of like overcoming necessarily that the viewer knew about. So I broke my kneecap in 2018 and, uh, I was, yeah. So I've limped around and knowing that I drew that tag, I actually had a cortisone shot in my kneecap in order to walk downhill. And so the viewer doesn't know that, but to me, it's so meaningful because I did have to overcome that battle, that struggle. I don't want to like complain. I don't want to talk up because I know people go through all kinds of stuff. Like I'm not the only one out there. Like we all battle our own, our own things. But that to me made that hunt even more special and that my dad was there and he was proud of me. And it ends the film with him giving me a hug. And I can't describe how I felt in that moment. Like it fulfilled, that's the name of the hunt. Uh Uh, So, I mean, it just fulfilled such a lifetime dream of what the elk hunt could be like in Oregon when I spent my, look, that was my first 12 years old putting in for, putting in for points in Oregon. So that's it. Okay. So that's, that's kind of a two in one answer, but I would say so that outside of called, that, the two black tail hunts for folks that are listening, that's fulfilled. called Winnaha bull archery elk fulfilled. And uh, it's from two years ago, it looks like, and, um, they should go watch it. We'll put a link in the description field of the video, but, and what was the yeah, other, and then one? the last ones the, so that other ones are that my black tail hunts, obviously, and kind of leaning towards this year's hunt more again, because one. of, yeah, because of what I, what I went through to be able to pull that off and shoot a mature buck and all the stars kind of aligned. It was a grind. Great film. There's That's so much to it. I can't back. even. Yeah. Yeah. My Kodiak hunt with my dad too is like a close third because That's while we edited it and it's. It's just, again, with my dad, that's what's so special to me is like, I get him for such a short amount of time, you know, while I'm alive too, Mm -hmm. like he raised me, but yet like our time's limited. And when we, when we capture those moments on film, it was successful. We got, well, that, that uh, sick of buck I killed is um, in the top 20 for archery and it's a 107. He's a great buck. And (laughs) so a lot of people aren't necessarily realizing that. (laughs) And then we're wearing those stupid decoy hats. I hate it. My dad's like, wear the hat. You wear the hat. They walk right in. He's they, like, they don't come in every time. And so we're those stupid hats and uh, it's just brutal conditions. It's, it's, it's special so wet, too, because dude. Roy Roth was supposed to be there. You know, Roy Roth, you heard of him? Oh yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. So Roy was supposed to be there. He set up the hunt and then had actually just recently passed. Um, and so that was so hard for us to even go through with it, but it did happen. And that was our... That was our 2015 and then 2019 we returned. And that was what that film captures is some highlights from 15. And then it was called return to Kodiak. So then we returned and we had a great trip again. It's just such an adventure. There's um, I have some cool film. So Nate Simmons on the Western Hunter made a film called unplanned and he actually, that's our hunt. So he airs it on the Western Hunter unplanned. It, It has a recording of, Hey, Nate, it's my dad calling Nate. Hey, Nate, on his answering machine yeah, landline. Yeah. I saw like, that. Like, hey, it's Wayne. Oh, you saw that? Yep, I did. Okay. Uh-huh. So, and it and it shows such a great tribute to Roy and his yeah, humor yes. and him and Cam yeah. bantering. You got to, if you have never seen that, you got to figure out how to watch Unplanned from the Western Hunter uh, by Nate Simmons. Such a good hunt. So that was our, if you watch my return to Kodiak, that was like the other end of the camera or like the other guy holding the camera. That's our view of the hunt. Um And, uh, Nate let us use a little bit of his footage that he could. Um, so yeah, I would say that's a good summary. I've got a lot of films. My bear hunts are decent. Yeah. That's it right there. That's That's my dad. Breathtaking. He's he's got a good double throat patch. I mean, just the coat on that Kodiak box. Yeah. And we're not professionals, right? Like I literally dad's like drawing his bow when I'm pulling out the camera. (laughs) It's like, it's going down. And he's like, did you get that on film? I'm like, I I, I think think so. Honestly though. I'm like stuttering. I think honestly, so many of us prefer this to the polished, overly produced pro cameraman type stuff. 
um, you know, there's an Thank element you. of just uh, authenticity and realness to this that we can all relate to. These shots of your dad on the on these mountains are just epic, dude. Isn't See, that this cool? is this is where you're running the camera, so you you don't you don't really get to be in the camera that much. It's just it's just your head, and then everyone else yeah. in the film looks incredible. But this is cool, yeah. man. I I think uh, folks ought to go and check out your YouTube channel, which if they just type in nathan endicott or endicott films in youtube it'll pop up they should subscribe binge watch all your shows how many you got like 10 12 or so i think i didn't even count i think i just dropped there was 18 and then my dad's is 19 the sheep hunt which will eventually come Some out more. but it'll be full draw film toured for the next you know several months through the summer so and then soon to be my arizona 2022 over the counter tag i uh, got this really old buck Oh, it's such a cool hunt. I've got incredible footage. I haven't touched it. I'm nervous to touch it. You know what I mean? That yeah, like, yeah. that angst before you get into it. Yeah. I'm like trying to get my head right. Uh, it's 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 so special that you know once I I edit off of momentum, you kind of build momentum as you edit, and then you pack it package it up. While you talked about building flow charts and things like that, so you you can kind of see it in your head, so you don't have to necessarily write it out. So mm -hmm. it's all in my head, and I'm kind of just dreaming. Like, what could this hunt be? I've got yeah. all the components of a good film. It's like, I don't want to rush into it. So I'm going to hold on to that for a little bit. And then eventually when I get into it, I'll just knock it out. But yeah, that's a fun one. And I, and I follow along your, your Arizona hunts and now recently Mexico and it just, ah, yeah. So I'm watching your series and they've been good. I like that you killed that nice. big buck with the sweeping main beams. He's <laughs> yeah. real long and he splits the, yeah, cool buck. So, um, yep. I'm thinking about doing a film school like a four or five day film school i've been thinking about it for a while because when i first started it was like 2015 2014 15 cody callum had been uh yeah. he did with the full draw film school they had done a a full draw film tour they had done a film school and i joined up christy titus was there and jason phelps and born and raised yeah. and south cox and I, there's there's others there was a there's a number of people there and I, and I got to hang out with them and I learned I learned a lot in a four day window that completely changed my trajectory um I didn't even have a podcast and I didn't have anything at the time I just wanted to learn yeah. for myself and then it just blew up into something as things progressed and so I thought about it because it was a pivotal moment for me i mean it changed my life and i thought man i, I would i've been thinking about doing a, a similar thing we get you know 15 people together and try to you know do a film school so i've been thinking about that but um i would love to be involved <laughs> it'd be great i think uh if if you could yeah. join us because it would be a, a really cool um i think it's that kind of place you know what i mean um to to learn yeah. from each other um yeah someday we should do a hunt for sure film each other <laughs> uh on a on a hunt so people can meet you on uh, on a film as well because i feel like um um being able to have i've been on hunts where now brad is pretty proficient i've been on some hunts like with hunter mcwaters and uh pedro ampuero and when you get somebody else who can run a camera to go with you and you can film each other it's so nice. And the footage you come home with yeah. is so usable. Um, and uh, it's tough, tough filming on your own. I finally have gotten to a point where I have, I can have someone film with me, usually, you know, Brad or somebody, but yeah. you're doing it the hard way. So I commend you for that. Um, folks that are listening, go check it out. Nathan's channel on YouTube. I'll put links in the description field and some to the movies as well. Nathan, you got anything you want to throw in here then? Um, at the end, so just to reinforce what I've been saying is that like, you know, for me, hunting is about that experience. It's about promoting hunting as a sport. The one thing that connects us as hunters is that we're a big body of like-minded individuals that like to work for our food and enjoy that food, something we bring to the table, support our families. So that is a huge part that binds us. We are connected as, as hunters. Okay. And so anything that comes against that hunting opportunity, we have to work together as a team. 
So when you're working with agency government officials who are managing that game, and Brian, you've recently done this, it's like we always have to work our best to build those relationships with the agency folks that are going to be talking to the commissions to continue hunting as we know it. Because that is right now, it's not a human right, it's a privilege. And that privilege can be taken away. We don't ever want to let that privilege be taken away from us. I want so badly that my kids get to grow up in America and hunt big game species, however they choose, and bring that home and live off of that food. It's it's who we are as humans. So I so much hope that if you've heard anything today, you've heard that we are as hunters are a body, we're working together, and we want to preserve that. So the way you conduct yourself, I'm not going to tell you how to do it. I'm not going to give you any lessons. Just keep that in mind when you're on the social media platforms, when you're talking to others, we're promoting, we're working together, we're preserving hunting and it's conservation. There's so many things I could say there, but I'll leave it short and sweet and say, thank you for listening. Uh, If you like my (laughs) films, thank you so much. You know, it's, it's just something I love to do. My win again is that my kids get to watch it, that I'm carrying on the legacy of the Endicott's. And that it's something I will always love to do, despite however many subscribers I have. But Brian, thank you so much for for doing that. The wise person would say thank you for that opportunity. So I will say thank you for that opportunity <laughs> and also letting me talk. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Appreciate you coming on, folks. Thank you for tuning in, and and uh, check out Nathan's channel. We'll see you next time. And stay gritty.